Oh, look, it's my favorite friends. Hello. Okay, it should be like 11.55, 12 o'clock. I just left. You guys just had lunch and recess. We're going to start reading class. I know I said we weren't doing reading yesterday, but you know what? Change of plans. Love, love it. We're going to have reading. You're going to go to music. We're going to come back. You're going to do reading. You're going to have recess. And then we're going to come back after recess. You're going to finish up reading. And then you'll have the rest of the day for yourself to do independent work time. So we're going to do this a little bit different than anything we've done kind of before. It'll be like for real e-learning. But just think, Mrs. Kneifel's at home getting her roof done. You're at school with Miss Parrish. Hi, Miss Parrish. Thank you for being here. Hello, friends. Make sure you are focused, paying attention. Miss Parrish is going to be walking around, making sure you are doing the right thing. Okay? So, yesterday we read so much in Walk Two Moons, and we... Snap. Oh my gosh, so much happened. So let's recap on what we've read this week in general. Okay? Let's do a recap. Chapter 12 was all about the marriage bed. And that was where we learned about Graham and Gramps' special um, thing they said every night. Gramps says to Grandma, well, this ain't our marriage bed. Well, it'll do if they're not home sleeping in their own bed. And we learned that that was the bed Gramps was born in and all his siblings were born in. And it was a bed from his parents. And he got it on his wedding day. And it's just extremely special to him. And it's extremely special not only to him, but also Graham's as well. So that is what that chapter was about, was about how Graham and Gramps' story began. Remember, Gramps decided, I also don't have my glasses on, so I'm sorry, I look funny. And I'm wearing my, you know, silly robe, but whatevs. Um, and I'm in my bedroom. Welcome to Mrs. Kleinfeld's bedroom. But I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Um... We also heard about how Graham and Grams met. You know, Gramps was always wild, crazy, but then he saw Graham and was like, oh, snap, I need to marry her, you know. Oh, Lordy. So, you know, he saw Grams have to marry her, and Grams was like, well, do you have a dog? And he's like, yeah, I got a dog. Of course I got a dog. Like, my dog's lovely. And then she decided, well, if you treat your dog good, you're going to treat me good. So we had Chapter 12 all about Graham and Gramps. And then we moved on to chapter 13, which was Bouncing Berkway. And we heard about Mr. Berkway, Sal's English teacher. And we heard about those journals. And um, the journals that Sal didn't write, remember, um, because she didn't have, she was new to the school. So, of course, she didn't have that summer journal. But everyone was like, oh, my God, he's going to read these journals. Oh, my God, he's going to take these journals. And we also heard Mr. Berkway is, like, real pumped up. He's like, I love teaching. He sounds like my type of friend. But, okay, Mr. Berkway sounds real fabulous. And then at the very end, remember, we talked about foreshadowing on chapter, or on page 83, because it says, we had absolutely no idea all the trouble they were going to cause. That is that foreshadowing. We know somewhere in this book, we're going to be hearing again about those summer journals. Chapter 14 was all about the rhododendron and how, um... You know, Phoebe, with more about Phoebe's story and how Sal is just constantly noticing that Mrs. Winterbottom seems so unhappy and Phoebe's just not seeing that. Phoebe's not seeing that Mrs. Winterbottom's unhappy. Also, Mrs. Cadaver and Mr. Berkway, we find out somehow they know each other. Don't know how, but they know each other. They dug up a rhododendron together. Phoebe's for sure. Mrs. Cadaver's husband, Mr. Cadaver's buried in her backyard. Phoebe and her lunatics. I know. She's crazy. Um, did anything else really happen in that? Yeah, just that, you know, Phoebe was, or Phoebe's just not seeing how upset her mother, or how upset her mother is. And then also at the back of 14, we hear, or we see um, when Sal get, kind of gets mad at her dad because Margaret gave her that sweater. And she's like, no, I don't want the sweater. So she kind of was like, she said she heard like Phoebe in herself. She didn't care. She didn't want to hear it. Just like how Phoebe wasn't hearing, you know, how her mom was sad. Chapter 15 was the oh snap because it was a snake has had a snack. And Graham and Gramps, just like we read in the very beginning of the story, of course, are getting in all types of trouble. They were hot, sticky, sticky hot in South Dakota. They just, oh, they found a river. Let's just go swimming in it. And water moccasin, poisonous snake, bit Grams. Luckily, Tom Fleet, we learn his name later. 
was there saying it was private property. He was able to, which remember I said, don't ever do in real life, suck out the wound. And he was able to direct them to the hospital. And Graham was able to survive this tragic accident. But she was bit by a water moccasin because, you know, they just had to cool down in the river. So that was a big chapter with lots of scary stuff happening. Remember, Gramps would not leave her side. He tried to pay Tom Flea with the 50 bucks he had, but Tom was like, no, keep it. And Tom kept Sal company in the waiting room all night. Like Tom didn't have to do that, but he literally just slept in the waiting room right by Sal just to keep her company. So go Tom Fleet. And then um, remember Tom gave in chapter 16, Tom gave Sal his address in case she ever wants to write him. We also heard about the singing tree in chapter 16 and the singing tree we'll hear more and more about as we go um the singing tree is a thing that sal kind of made up she you know when you're outside and you hear a bird you hear a sound you know it's a bird in a tree but she said um you know she'd heard a bird but she calls it a singing tree because sometimes when you hear a bird in a tree you can't actually see the bird so it's like as if the tree is singing and not the bird so there's this special tree at her home in by banks that when her mother left she just went and listened to and listened to and listened to this special singing tree but the tree didn't sing to her which means really there was no birds but as soon as they left the hospital they heard this singing tree meaning there's a bird somewhere in it but they say you know the tree's actually singing and that was a good sign. So we heard about the singing tree. And then last but not least was we read chapter 17 together in the course of a lifetime. And this one, they got their third thing, their third note from the mysterious person. And it was in the course of a lifetime. What does it matter? And I think... Um, that is my favorite message from the lunatic so far because that is so important. Some things that seem so serious, so big, so upsetting right now. Guess what? Tomorrow, the next day, two weeks from now, one year from now, they're just not going to matter. It really puts things into perspective. In the course of a lifetime, what is it going to matter? And I think this chapter is really important because um, Sal sees Phoebe get mad at her mother and be like, you know, yells at her, or Prudence, one of them yells at their mother. I don't know. Actually, I think Prudence and Phoebe both yelled at their mother. And then they ended up yelling at each other. And, you know, Phoebe's mom is already, like, really upset and sad, and they don't even notice it. And then Sal's remembering one of the last conversations she had with her own mom. She kind of snapped at her just because she was busy doing something, and she didn't want to hang out with her mom. She wasn't trying to be mean, but she snapped at her mom. And then guess what? That was one of the last conversations she had with her mom before her mom left for Lewiston, Idaho. And she's saying, like, that is something that matters in the course of Sal's lifetime. Like, that conversation, Sal feels like, changed her life. Because she thinks, you know, that was one of the last things my mom heard me heard me say. You know, my mom hasn't heard me say something kind since then. Because then my mom chose to leave. So Sal thinks that is something that changed the course of her lifetime. Where, you know, Phoebe and Prudence are arguing. And Phoebe's like, do tree lighting tryouts really matter? No. No, they don't. You know, so that one is my absolute favorite in the course of a lifetime. What does it matter? And Mrs. Kneifel should think that more in her own lifetime. So we are going to finish our last chapter for week two of Walk Two Moon. So you should be on page 107 and should be reading along with me. Also, disclaimer, whenever it Mrs. Parrish or, or Miss Parrish already has the directions on her notes or on her already has these you know, directions on this um, guest teacher plans. Whenever it's time for reading or music, she's just going to pause this. You guys are going to go to music. You're going to come back. You're going to continue watching this. When it's time for recess, she's going to pause it. You're going to go to recess. When recess is over, you're going to come back and you're going to finish. That's how this is going to go. In case you're curious. So 18, the good man. I should mention my father. We haven't really heard about her father, so that's probably good. So, yeah. We haven't really heard about her father too much. I should mention my father. When I was telling Phoebe's story to Graham and Grams, I did not say much about my father. He was their son. And not only did they know him better than I, but as Grams often said, he was the light of their lives. That's an expression. Like People say that, like the most important thing in their lives. They had three other sons at one time. But one son died when a tractor flipped over on him, 
One was killed when he skied into a tree, and the third died when he jumped into a freezing cold Ohio River to save his best friend. The best friend survived, but my uncle did not. So that is a lot of loss that Graham and Gramps have been through. So they originally had four sons, which we heard about um, these brothers during the marriage bed thing when... Um, Oh, no, we didn't hear about that yet. I take that back. We haven't heard about these brothers. Anyways, beep, beep, take that back. Um, so, Graham and Gramps originally have four sons, and now only one of them are alive. So, obviously, Sal's father is probably extremely important to them because they had these tragic accidents. Tractor flipped over on him, skied into a tree, probably had his head and maybe cracked his skull. Fun fact, little story. Love some background knowledge. Mrs. Kneifel's brother almost died skiing one time. Um, we were children, but my brother somehow ended up skiing into a building. Yeah, I don't know how that was happened. The ski slopes were poorly designed. Skiing is when you're on like two things, you know, with your feet, not a snowboard where they're connected. It's like two. And he uh, somehow skied into a building and um, it cracked his helmet. So if he wouldn't have had that helmet on, he would have died. So it's a true thing that can happen. Then the other one jumped into a river to save his best friend. And luckily the best friend was able to live, but the uncle didn't. So he probably got hypothermia or maybe drowned. So that's a lot of loss that his grandparents, have, her grandparents have suffered. My father was the only son left. But even if the other sons were still alive, my father might still be their light because he is also kind, honest, simple, and a good man. All of those are adjectives, which we learned about last week. I do not mean simple as in simple-minded. I mean he likes plain and simple things. His favorite clothes are flannel shirts and blue jeans that he has had for 20 years. And nearly killed him to buy white shirts and a suit for his new job in Euclid. He loved the farm because he could go out in the real air. And he wouldn't wear work gloves because he liked to touch the earth and the wood and the animals. It was painful for him to go to work in an office when we moved. He did not like being sealed up inside with nothing real to touch. So that is one thing. So remember, Sal absolutely hates Euclid, Ohio. And we talked about last week how we thought a lot of us thought that no matter where she went, she wasn't going to be happy. She was going to be without her mother. You know, like, of course, she's not going to be happy in Euclid. There's these birdhouse houses and she doesn't have this big farm and these beautiful trees and all this stuff. OK, well, her father moved and her father moved her. So, you know, in our minds, we instantly think, oh, her father must be happy. You know, he's the one that chose to move. Well, you know, we haven't really been taking in her father's happiness. We haven't really heard much about him. OK, well, he also liked his life back in Bybanks. He's not happy with his job here in Euclid. So we have to be thinking, why did he decide to move to Euclid? Like there must be some reasons behind the move that we just aren't aware of yet. We'd had the same car, a blue Chevy, for 15 years. He couldn't bear to part with it because he had touched and repaired every inch of it. I also think he couldn't bear the thought of if he sold it, someone might take it to the junkyard. My father hated the whole idea of putting cars out to the pasture. That means like a junkyard. It's a, putting cars out to the pasture. That's like a car junkyard. Like you're putting them out there and then they're just good as gone. You know, they aren't used anymore. He often prowled through junkyards, touching old cars and buying old alternators and carburetors just for the joy of cleaning them up and making them work again. My grandfather had never quite gotten the hang of car mechanics so he thought my father was a genius number gramps and his car busterators and all the snakes and ladies car yeah crazy like he's not the best with the cars but apparently her father is my mother was right when she said my father was good he was always thinking of little things to cheer someone else up cheer up someone else they nearly drove my mother crazy but I think she wanted to keep up with him. It was not her natural gift like it was my father. He would be out in the field and see a flowering bush that my grandmother might like. And he would dig up the whole thing and take it straight over to Graham's garden and replant it. If it snowed, he would get up at dawn to take over to the, his parents' house and shovel out their driveway. If he went into town to buy supplies for the farm, he would come back with something for my mother and something for me. They were small things, a cotton scarf, a book, a glass paperweight. 
But whatever he brought, it was exactly what you would have picked out for yourself. Think you're human, my mother told him. It was the sort of thing she said just before she left, and it bothered me. Because it seemed as if she wanted him to be meaner, less good. Two days before she left, when I first heard a rise of the subject of leaving, she said, I feel so rotten in comparison. So Chan Hassan or Sugar, you know, Sal's mom, rotten in comparison to Sal's father. Meaning maybe she just doesn't feel as good as him. Sugar, you're not rotten, he said. See, she said, see, why couldn't you at least believe I'm rotten? Because you're not, he said. She said she had to leave in order to clear her head and to clear her heart of all the bad things. Okay, so page 109, this is the first we're hearing of why Sal's mom is deciding to leave or decided, because she already did it, to leave to Lewiston, Idaho. She had to leave in order to clear her head and her heart of bad things. She needed to learn about what she was. You can do that here, sugar, he said. I need to do it on my own, she said. I can't think. All I see here is what I'm not. I am not brave. I am not good. And I wish someone would call me by my real name. My name isn't sugar. It's Chan Hassan. She had not been well. She had had some terrible shocks. It was true, but I did not understand why she could not get better with us. So that might be a little bit of foreshadowing there. Maybe we're going to learn a, a little bit about her mom later. Like she had had some terrible shocks. Like we don't know anything that's terrible that's happened to her mom. So we need to be on the lookout for that. Are we going to learn something that's going to happen to her? Are we going to learn that or no? So we need to be on the lookout for that. I begged her to take me with her, but she said I could not miss school, and my father needed me. And besides, she had to go alone. She had to. I thought she might change her mind, or at least tell me when she was leaving. But she did neither of those things. Imagine whoever you live with, mom, dad. Can you imagine if your mom or dad were left to go on a big trip, and they didn't even say goodbye to you? They didn't wake you up to give you a big old hug goodbye? That would be really hard. When Mr. Kneifel goes on his hunting trips, he always says goodbye to me. That would be hard to not know when someone was officially leaving. She left me a letter which explained that if she said goodbye, it would be too terribly painful and it would sound too permanent. Permanent means something like you can't change. She wanted me to know that she would think of me every minute and that she would be back before the tulips bloomed. But of course, she was not back before the tulips bloomed. That's a good thing to know. So we know her original plan was to come home. But as of right now in our story, she never came home. And nearly killed my father after she left. I know it. But he continued on doing everything just as before. Whistling and humming and finding little gifts for people. He kept bringing home gifts for my mother and stacking them in a pile in their bedroom. On the day after... There's some sirens going on. Sorry. On the day after he found out she wasn't returning, he flew to Lewiston, Idaho. And when he came back, he spent three days chipping away at the fireplace behind the plaster wall. Some of the cement grouting between the bricks had to be replaced. And he wrote her name in the new cement. He wrote Chan Hassan, not Sugar. Three weeks, three weeks later, he put up the farm for sale. By this time, he was receiving letters from Margaret or from Mrs. Cadaver, and I knew he was answering her letters. Then he drove up to see Mrs. Cadaver while I stayed with Graham and Gramps. When he came back, he said we were moving to Euclid. Mrs. Cadaver had helped him find a job. Okay, that's pretty pretty quick. We don't know how long her mom's trip was to Lewiston, like from when she left to when they found out she wasn't coming home. We don't know how long that chunk of time it was yet. But anyways, flew to Lewiston, Came back, spent three days chipping away, and then three weeks later, put the farm up for sale. Like, oh, snap. Like, that's a, that's a big deal. Oh. And then goes to see Mrs. Cadaver, and now they're moving. Got a new job. 
That's like pretty quick, especially for a child to process. That's a lot. There are seriously like some little storm little things happening in Mrs. Knipel's town in Westville. I didn't even wonder how he met Mrs. Cadaver or how long he had known her. I ignored her whole existence. Besides, I was too busy throwing the most colossal, which means huge, one of our vocab words, temper tantrums. I refused to move. I would not leave our farm, our maple tree, our swimming hole, our pigs, our chickens, our hayloft. I would not leave the place that belonged to me. I would not leave the place to which I was conceived, which I was convinced my mother might return. At first, my father did not argue with me. He let me behave like a wild boar. At last, he took the for sale sign down and put up a for rent sign. Okay, well, that's a kind of a compromise, kind of meeting her in the middle a little bit. He said he would rent out the farm, hire someone to take care for the animals and the crops and rent the house for us and rent a house for us in Euclid. The farm would still belong to us and one day we could return to it. Okay, that's a pretty good compromise, at least... Kind of, you know, he was going to sell the house, get rid of everything. And Sal was like, oh, no, we're not doing that. Like she was throwing these tantrums like we can't do that. We can't do that. Absolutely not. And he said, OK, we'll rent it. That means it's still theirs. They still own it. Just someone else will be living there. That way they can come back if they ever want to or need to. But for now, he said, we have to leave because your mother is haunting me day and night. She is in the fields, the air, the barn, the walls, the trees. He said, we were making this move to learn about bravery and courage. That sounded awfully familiar. Remember Sal's mom, that's kind of why she went on that journey to begin with, because she was not brave and she had not, she needed to find these things about herself. So she needed to find these things about herself and she left. And because of that, they needed to go on their own journey to find about bravery and courage. So funny how that worked out. In the end, I think I merely ran out of steam. I stopped throwing tantrums. I didn't help pack. But when it came time, I climbed in the car and I joined my father for our move to Euclid. I did not feel brave. I did not feel courageous. When I told my story of Phoebe to Graham and Graham, so I mentioned none of this. They knew it already. Remember, Graham and Gramps live in Kentucky. Like, they lived close to Sal and her father. So they were already aware of these tantrums. They were aware that the, you know, house was once up for sale, then for rent. So she didn't need to repeat it. And they knew my father was a good man. They knew I did not want to leave the farm. They knew my father felt we had to leave. They also knew my father had tried many times to explain to me about Margaret, but that I wouldn't hear it. On that long day that my father and I left the farm behind and drove to Euclid, I wished my father was not such a good man, so there would be someone to blame for my mother's leaving. I didn't want to blame her. She was my mother. She was part of me. Sometimes when things happen, it's we want someone to blame. You know, we want a reason for something. You know, it's easy to make excuses and to be like, you know, sometimes even I'm going to give an example, like maybe you forgot your lunchbox at home. And you're like, oh, my mom didn't put it in my backpack. Like, oh, well, you just blamed your mom. You made her the scapegoat. So she, Sal doesn't want to blame her mom for leaving. So she's wishing like, oh, I wish it was my dad's fault. I wish my father was mean or did something bad to my mom. And that was the reason she left. But she can't. Like she knows her father didn't do anything. It was her mom's choice to leave. But she's just having such a hard time blaming her mom for leaving. Okay, so we just finished chapter 18. And now second section of this, I'm going to share the Google Docs questions. And we're going to walk through these questions together. So I need you to keep your book out, but get on your Google Classroom and go to Walk to Moon's Week 2 Questions. And I'm going to share my thing. My like tornado sirens are still going off here. They're being really annoying. I should text my husband. He's in the living room. Okay, so hopefully you're getting to yours and you can see mine. So, chapter or week two, chapter 12 through 18. So, we've read that this week. So, we just finished 18. Okay, answer each question using complete sentences. Be sure to restate your question. Some cancer questions we're going to answer together as a group. Others you're going to complete on your own. Ooh, Mrs. Is that a comma? Yeah, okay. 
Perfect. So we're going to talk these through. And what's going to happen is I'm going to read the question to you. We're going to talk about it. And then Miss Parrish is going to pause my video. When I say pause, she's going to pause. And you're going to type out your answer. You're going to type out your answer. Okay. You're going to type it out. And then when everyone's good, she's going to be walking around. When everyone's good to go, she's going to press play. And we're going to continue on and so on and so forth until we're done. So number one is about foreshadowing, which is what we already talked about. But let's just read it anyways. Foreshadowing refers to the hints and clues an author gives about future events in a story. What do you think the author is foreshadowing in the last paragraph of chapter 16? So let Mrs. Knifel go to the last paragraph of chapter. Oh, that's not chapter 16. That's not chapter 16 either. Oh, here. Chapter 16. The last paragraph of chapter 16. I'm going to reread it for us. As we swept across South Dakota towards the Badlands, the whispers no longer said hurry, hurry, or rush, rush. They now said slow down, slow down. I could not figure this out. It seemed some sort of warning, but I did not have too much time to think about it as I was busy telling about Phoebe. So we kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday, well, today technically, but it, now that you're seeing this now, it would be yesterday, because I said the whole story up until now, it was all been hurry, hurry, get there, get there. And then Gramps had that accident, and now all of a sudden it's like, <gasps> slow down. So what do you think, like right now, what do you think the author is foreshadowing by changing her inner thoughts from hurry, hurry, rush, rush, to slow down, slow down? So right now. Miss Parrish is going to pause the video and you're going to say, I believe the author is trying to foreshadow that blankety blank, blankety blank, 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 whatever you say, period. When you're done, make sure you let, you know, hands off the keyboard when Miss Parrish is ready. She's going to intro or she's going to press pay and we'll go into number two. Okay. So right now she's going to pause. Okay. Hopefully you had all that time pausing. Now we're going to talk about number two. Imagery. We don't really talk about imagery a lot because as fifth graders, it's something we just do. Imagery is what you imagine in your brain, especially with chapter books and novels because there aren't those pictures. So it's what you are imagining in your brain. Imagery is an image is a or an image is a mental picture invoked, meaning like, you know, and brought on in prose or poetry by lots of metaphors and similes and figures of speech. What bird imagery have we encountered so far in Walk to Moon? So, Mrs. Kneifel was trying to think of this when we have heard of birds. So, we're just going to talk about this one. So, next to number two, you can ju I'm just going to tell you the time I can put it. So, you can just put talked about. You don't actually have to type this one out. When the times we've heard about birds is, first off, she's called Chickabitty, okay, by her grandparents. And Chickabitty's a bird, okay? Chickabitty? bird so throughout this entire book we hear that she's a chickabitty okay so when you know like i think like oh our little chickabitty i think of like our tiny little grandchild we also hear the singing tree remember we talked about this the singing tree is really it has to be birds in the tree like the tree itself is not actually singing so like we hear that bird imagery um when else do we hear about birds i totally went through this before i started this all right if you can think of another that's all i can think of right now if you can think of another time when we've encountered birds in our story so far type them out really really quick as i'm talking about the next one and then you can tell me tomorrow because i can't remember anymore right now i know there's more because i was really going through the book before i started this whole thing and now i forgot but that's okay number three what emotion does Ben invoke, like bring on, when he asks Sal why she flinches whenever she is touched? So this question is from like more the beginning um, or from earlier in the story. And remember, when Ben touches Sal, she always flinches. And Sal is instantly like, am I becoming stiff? You know, am I, you know, she's so worried she's becoming stiff. She, you know, people. 
she's like afraid of people and she's not being hugged enough and things like that. So right now, Miss Parrish is going to pause and you're going to write me at least one sentence about the emotions that Sal feels when Ben points out like, what the heck? Why are you always flinching? So right now, Miss Parrish is going to pause and you're going to do that. When she's good to go, she's going to replay the next one. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're back. Number four. Okay, I already talked about number four heavy when I started this video. What comment does Gramps make to Graham every night? Well, every night he says, well, this ain't our marriage bed, but it'll do. And just think, if they were at home in their bed, do you think he'd be making that comment? No, because it is their marriage bed. So he'd probably be like, we're in our marriage bed. Life is great. But every night of the trip, he's saying, this ain't our marriage bed, but it'll do. And what story lies behind this comment? You don't have to type this all out. You can put just talked, you know, verbal or whatever, how Mrs. Kneifel was telling it. Um, remember, this story was this, their marriage bed. They got it on the night of their wedding. It was originally his parents' bed. And he was, you know, all his brothers had been born in it. That bed has known everything about him, um, Graham says. And he says he wants to die in that bed. That way his that bed knows everything about him. And the bed is just extremely important to him. And it just describes Graham and Graham's relationship that it's so strong. That he's saying, you know, even though this isn't, you know, our perfect bed. And this is where we're, you know, this isn't where we're meant to be. This hotel room or this hospital room. It's not where we're meant to be. Guess what? It's fine. It's fine that it's not where we're meant to be. Because it'll do because we have each other. So it's just really pointing out how strong their relationship is, I think. And I hope you're agreeing with me right now. Number five, you are going to do on your own. And I am expecting a good, good answer right now. So what unexpected event causes a sudden change in the trio's travel plans? So there are two questions to this. And I expect you to answer both questions. The trio would be Graham, Gramps, and Sal. And who is Tom Fleet? Oh, that says two Fleet. It's supposed to say Tom Fleet. And how does he help? Miss Parrish is going to pause. And I'm expecting her to be pausing for quite a while. Because I want a good answer. I want you to retell me exactly what happens. Who Tom Fleet is. And how the heck he helps. And without him, maybe what would have happened. So right now, Miss Parrish is going to pause. She'll bring it up in a little bit. Okay. Hopefully your number five is great. Remember, I have access to these. So um, this afternoon, after you're all done with this and Mrs. Kneifel is still waiting on her roof to get finished, I have access and I'm going to check out these. So hopefully you're doing a good job. Number six. This is another question I want you to answer because it's a why do you think question. Why do you think Sal does not want her father to tell her about Margaret? So think about what we know about Sal and her mother, how much she cares about her mother, how much she misses her mother, how much she wants her mother to come back home. Think about how little we kind of know about Margaret. And we really don't know too much about Sal's dad yet either. So why do you think Sal doesn't want to know anything about Margaret? Remember, Margaret came into the picture a few weeks after, well, not a few weeks, a few weeks after Sal found out her mother wasn't coming home. Remember, we don't know how long Sal's mother had already been gone from when she left to when she found out she wasn't coming home. But then a few weeks after she found out she wasn't coming home is when Margaret came into the picture. So right now. This is kind of, um, you're making some inferences here. Like, based on the information we know from our story, why do you think Sal doesn't want to know more about Margaret? So you're going to say, I believe that Sal does not want her father to tell her more about Margaret because blah, 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 period. Also, blah, 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 blah. Like, feel free to use the book to help you. Right now, Miss Parrish is going to pause. You're going to do number six. Okay. And the final one is uh, really my favorite one. And I can't wait to read all these. Opinion question. How would you respond if a teacher wanted to read your private journal? And what kind of trouble do you think the summer journals are might cause in Mr. Berkway's class? So I'm expecting this opinion question to be a full paragraph long. And this is a total opinion questions. Like, how would you feel if you wrote in a journal all summer long? And then the teacher was like, snap, let me read this. Let me read it. And you have no idea what he's going to do with it. Like, you, he's going to snap it up. And then, like, how do you think these summer journals are going to come into play later? So right now you're going to finish this reading section up with a paragraph. Okay? So before you start doing that, Mrs. Kneifel is going to finish with the rest of her 
directions. So, um, hopefully this has worked. You do not have to officially turn this review questions into me. Like I said, I have access to them even without you turning them in. And then tomorrow, um, we're going to go through and I'm going to have um, volunteers to read some of their answers to me. And that's what we're going to do during reading tomorrow. But I do expect the questions that I asked you to officially answer you to do that by tomorrow. After you finish all your questions and you are good to go, Mrs. Parrish is um, going to reiterate these things. But things you may do until the end of the day. You can read for AR or AR test. We only have about three more weeks for you to get those 20 AR points. You can go on eSparks. That's something you can always do. You can go on Spelling City and study your spelling words. We have a test on Friday. You can study your um, states where they're located because we have that test again on Friday alone at your desk. You can also study your capitals if you're one of my friends moving on to capitals. You can also work on your math homework. Remember, we are not, I repeat, not working on our posters during this time because Mrs. Kneifel is just, you know, crazy lady. And I just don't want you guys to actually mess it up and me not be there to fix it. And I don't want anyone using my blade cutter thing while I'm not there. So you are not working on your posters during this time. You are doing any of the things I just listed. Mrs. Miss Parrish has a list as well. So she, if you forgot what I just said, she can also make a list for you. But that are the those are the things you are doing after you have finished all of your reading questions. Hopefully this was not too hard to follow. If you, I mean, Miss Parrish is there to help you. She is a real teacher. And um, if you have any questions, please ask her. I will see you guys in the morning. If you have questions, email me. Like I said, I'm literally sitting at home right now, missing you guys, getting my roof done. So I will see you all tomorrow. Have a fabulous day.